I am one of the long-standing members of the Litecoin team, getting involved with projects back in 2013. In 2016, I helped found the Litecoin Foundation, and I'm one of its active directors. More recently, I've set up my own company in the canton of uh, Zug in Switzerland, called Litecoin House, to help develop privately solutions for Litecoin and blockchain. And I've also partnered with Zulu Republic and become their COO to help develop the solutions they are bringing to the space, some of which I will be talking about here. But first of all, we really need to understand why do we need a blockchain in order to understand what are going to be the killer apps for it? After all, blockchains are slow, they are rigid, and they are horrendously inefficient at times. And this is because we need something called consensus. People from all over the world need to come together and agree a state of what is happening and then set that in stone. If any changes need to be made onto the network, these people have to come together and agree that this is the direction the network is going to take. However, if we can overlook this, what we end up with is something that is distributed, immutable and secure, and quite importantly, trustless. If you are going to need a blockchain, then it needs these three things. Otherwise, you are better off just using a database because you cannot overlook those three massive drawbacks. The second question we really need to ask ourselves is, do we need to decentralize everything? Just because we can do it, should we? A lot of the times, these things are good in theory and bad in practice, and sometimes as well, bad in theory and even worse in practice, whether people are trying to put utility services onto a blockchain, or even supply chains onto a blockchain. These things just do not work on the basis level. Other questions we need to ask ourselves are, what is the consensus model? And what is the incentive model? How are you going to get people to secure these chains if you want the data to be immutable and secure inside of them? So let's look at DAP platforms. These things have become absolutely massive and more are springing up every single day. The most popular of which is, of course, Ethereum, but there are others such as EOS. And yes, tokenization absolutely has merit. And I think it's a very important thing they have bought out. But it is the right idea with a wrong method. DAP platforms are quite often inherently broken. They have longevity issues, and they have complexity issues. By attempting to do so much stuff at the base layer of your protocol, it does long-term damage. People have been able to print numerous assets and ICO tokens directly into the base layer, and as a result, the blockchains of these things have become bloated. Ethereum currently sits at over one terabyte worth of data stored in its blockchain. Compare that to Bitcoin, which only has around 220 gigabytes, four times less, and it's been around twice as long. However, I think it is commendable to say to these DAP platforms that they are trying new ideas and pioneering new things, and that is always a good thing. However, the long-term solution for this is eventually going to be things like side chains, lightning networks, and even colored coins. Because we can already issue tokens on top of Litecoin and Bitcoin. We just don't need to do it into the base layer. We will build on top, and we will attach to them with two-way pegs through side chains. So let's look at money. Why did we put money onto a blockchain? Well, it was government controlled. And we know governments aren't very good with money at the best of times. So we took them as a trusted party out of the system and made it trustless. It's accountable. The ledger is open. Everybody can see where money is coming and going from in a real time way. So if they try to do anything, send our money anywhere where it's not supposed to be, we will know. We restored privacy to the user. We didn't have to attach names to transactions. 
people were free to interact with whoever they wanted. In a way, putting money on a blockchain was the greatest thing we could have done for individual liberty and autonomy. But the greatest question I often get asked is, if we have Bitcoin, why do we need other forms of money on the blockchain? Why do we need something like Litecoin? And the simple answer is the free market. The free market needs choice. It needs a place to be able to put its money in order to pressure change. Take, for example, in 2017 when we were trying to get SegWit pushed onto Bitcoin. The miners were completely staunch. They were not going to have it. So we took the drastic step and decided to implement it into Litecoin. We were told everybody's coins were going to be stolen. But it didn't happen. Instead, the people who really mattered in these systems, the users, put their money into Litecoin and voted with their wallets. They couldn't have done this with any other asset. Litecoin was the only one comparable to Bitcoin in terms of volume, liquidity, and importance and stature for being around this long. This, in turn, helped to pressure the change on the Bitcoin network. So while Litecoin is, in many ways, in competition with Bitcoin, it is also its greatest complement. And people often use this argument that Litecoin is simply a testbed, and that couldn't be further from the truth. In many ways, Bitcoin is just a testbed for Litecoin, and vice versa. Anything Bitcoin does, if it works, Litecoin can do it. Anything Litecoin pioneers that is getting stuck on Bitcoin, we can do and we can show the way that this is a good thing we should be pursuing. The other major thing about Litecoin is that it is number one in script hashing, making it the king of this category. It is not competing for miners with Bitcoin, which uses SHA-256, which means it is the most secure, as it is not sitting underneath anything. It is the king at the top of its castle. And another thing which may not be apparent now is layer two solutions. This is going to be a big deal in the future when it comes to scaling these networks. And Litecoin provides a fantastic opportunity with all of its liquidity and advanced speed on the network to onboard and move money at a global scale, something nothing else has and is often overlooked. After all, Litecoin and Bitcoin are powerful political and economical tools which anybody, anywhere can use without permission to transact with anybody else in the world and partake in a genuinely global economy. Which brings me on to the second thing, which is very interesting to me, identity solutions. Why do we need a blockchain for an identity? Well. In many ways, just like money, it too is government controlled. From passports to driver's license, social security numbers, national insurance numbers, all these things are issued by governments. If we take this out of the hands of governments, we too can restore privacy to the user. We do not have to reveal all the information in one's digital identity passport on a blockchain. Even so, borders are now becoming softer in the real world. People are starting to move around more freely. By giving everybody a digital passport, we know that the data held within it is in turn immutable, and they can verify themselves when they are moving around the world if need be. Say, for example, if someone's a refugee and they've been verified as such, when they land somewhere, they can easily prove it and be processed far quicker and current methods. And again, by doing so, we once more return individual liberty and autonomy to the user. So to give a couple more examples of this and what can actually be done with identity solutions, say we are people wanting to vote in an election in our country. We can attach this to a digital passport owned and controlled by us because it is, again, simple public and private key cryptography. And these things, of course, will be built on top of the most secure networks, such as Bitcoin and Litecoin, the ones that have set themselves apart and are going to be around for the next 10,000 and 100,000 years from now, because they are not messing with that base layer. But 
I can take my digital passport anywhere, and I can verify data about myself without having to necessarily reveal everything about myself. Say somebody needs to know if I'm over 18. Well, my digital passport can just return valid. They don't need to know when I was born. They don't need to know where I was born. They just need to know valid. Same with voting in elections. Do they need to know where I live, or do they just need to know that I'm valid to vote in an election? This is a level of privacy we can bring back to people with digital passports. And is a thing we're actually building with Zulu Republic. They are pioneering this and a beta version of it is actually going to be coming out in 2019, so look forward to that. And finally, I just want to end with this idea of idealism versus realism. No, cryptocurrency will not destroy the banks. I'm not one of those hardcore libertarian, overthrow the government type people. It will, however, greatly improve finance because it's the most transparent system we have seen to date. People should be free to associate with whoever they want to, be this a bank or hold the money themselves. We shouldn't be stopping them. That is completely totalitarian. We also need to kind of understand that money is boring and the average person simply does not care. When I pay for something here in South Korea, I only have great British pounds in my bank account. I don't care how I ended up paying a merchant here, I just care that it worked. And that's how these systems are going to look in the future. All these arguments about lightning networks and side chains being so complicated at the current moment, well, it's true, but it won't be. And that's the thing. We shouldn't be rushing ahead to try and do something completely radical when we know that the best way to do this for the longevity of the systems is via these safe ways. Institutions are going to be the ones really driving adoptions. They are the ones who will be implementing this technology in a very meaningful way, and I think we should work with them for the betterment of this system, not just for us, but for everybody who necessarily isn't even interested in cryptocurrency. Some of the companies currently pioneering this are Casanode and HTC, which have recently released their Exodus flagship smartphone which has nodes built directly into it to help decentralize these networks further and keep them secure for longer. And finally, another product I'm working on with Zulu Republic called Light. We have created the first way for users to be able to send digital currencies, Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Ethereum, over social media and SMS networks. And more recently, we're actually going to be releasing light for Kakao Talk, which I understand is big here in South Korea. And finally, I would just like to end with this little thing of the importance of change, which we don't often see in this space. So this is block propagation over the years. From 2015 on the Bitcoin network, and hardly anybody was using these things. Blocks weren't overflowing. This is 2018 when blocks were completely full and people were having to pay rather large amounts on the network just to process transactions. Yes, 2015 is actually moving just very slowly. This is a type of thing that really matters on these networks and helps keep them secure. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to talk off the stage. It's been an honor. Thank you.